Welcome everyone to the online version of the Learn to Burn One class. I'm your host, Morgan Metter. And today we will be discussing pre-burn planning with Calvin Wakefield. Calvin is a private lands biologist for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission out of the Calico Rock office. Thank you so much, Calvin, for joining us today. We're excited to hear what you have to say um, today. So with that, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Howdy, like Morgan said, my name is Calvin. I'm going to cover pre-burn planning. This is really where we get into the nuts and bolts of how to make sure a burn is successful and to plan to be successful. And one of the first steps in being able to plan it is knowing the main difference between a wildfire and a prescribed fire. A wildfire is something very destructive that can uh, wreak damage on a landscape and cause multiple issues while prescribed fire can be something that's very beneficial. And the main difference between the two is with a prescribed fire, you have the time and the information to plan and prepare for it, while a wildfire comes at you on its own terms. In Arkansas, we have a few rules and regulations on prescribed fire. Our rules are relatively liberal and allow a lot of flexibility to landowners. The main rule is notifying the Arkansas Forestry Division which this is just as simple as calling in and letting them know that you're burning, where you're burning and what you're burning. Um, we, the Arkansas Forestry Division tracks these burns so they know where controlled fires are and uncontrolled fires are because uncontrolled fires are a public nuisance and it allows them to fight any kind of wildfire versus not having to respond whenever someone reports smoke on a controlled burn. Um, the other big rule that we have here is no burning during burn bans, which is kind of counterintuitive, but it's worth noting because burn bans are set by a county judge and not by um, your Arkansas Forestry Division or by Game of Fish. They're set by the county judge based on whatever that judge sees as criteria to set a burn ban. So they'll vary from county to county, um, not with burn conditions, but with um, each county. In addition to the rules, there are a few things that are highly recommended to go along with your prescribed burn. The first of these and what the bulk of this talks are gonna focus on is your burn plan. With that, we recommend you get enough help and notify certain locals, um, including your sheriff's dispatch, your volunteer fire department and your neighbors. That way everyone knows what's going on and no one's calling in freaking out about what, about seeing smoke. And always make sure you hit, have adequate quit equipment for what you're burning. And we recommend these things mostly so you as a landowner can protect yourself and also protect the tool of burning because we do have such liberal burn laws in Arkansas. It only takes one negative event to get a bunch of restrictions imposed on our burning abilities. So like I said, the, both this talk's gonna focus on what a burn plan is and it's, Pretty simple. It's just a written document that outlines uh, several aspects of your burn. The first being the specific resource objectives. So this is why you're burning. The second being a description of the burn area, the fuels, the hazards, where the burn is, um, the weather conditions that are acceptable, and how those weather conditions will play into your smoke management, your ignition plan, how you plan to light the fire, um, the proper preparation for the burn unit itself, personnel needs to be able to do the burn safely, a contingency plan in case something goes wrong, and who to, needs to be contacted before the burn. These plans can be very detailed, long documents, or it can be something relatively short, just a page with a map that outlines these topics, and it just comes down to each burn is going to be a little different. So how detailed that plan is will be determined by the burn and what, if any, agencies are involved. So let's break these down a little further. Your resource objective is your why. What is the reason you're lighting the match? These goals need to be something that's measurable so it can be deemed a success or a failure. Making something burned in black isn't a goal. Having 90% fuel consumption is a goal because it can be measurable. So here's a unit that we look at and we see, okay, it's a lot of live grass. Um, we can see some thatch developing on the understory. Maybe our goal in this unit might be stimulate the herbaceous understory to get an increased density of forbs and reduce the grass thatch. You know, something simple, doesn't have to be overly detailed. 
and a unit like this where we've clearly done some TSI on that hickory in the foreground, it may be consume the veg or consume dead debris on the ground by 90% to encourage herbaceous stimulation. And an area where we went in and cut and dropped cedars and we've also mulched cedars, so we got a heavy fuel load on the ground, we might be looking at reduce the fuel load density on the ground by 50% and open up that um, forest floor so we can get some good growth. Area where we've done a lot of cedar cut and drop, it may be consume 50% of cedars on the ground so that we can see positive benefits. Whereas we get a closed canopy system such as this, where we not a lot of work's been done, we may go in and try to get 90% fuel consumption to prevent wildfires, and it may just be a debris management burn. Here's an example where we have cedar cut and drop mixed in with already some herbaceous growth. So we might have a goal or objective of opening it up, increasing more growth, um, remove these cedar piles. And on the back side, this has to be something that's measurable. If our goal here was remove 50% of the hardwood growth in the stand and come and uh, encourage herbaceous growth, we can see over half of those hardwood stand trees are dead. So we could call that successful. If our goal here was remove debris and kill small cedar saplings, it's obviously been accomplished. This is one of those stands that was mulched and you can see that we got majority consumption of the fuel on the ground. So depending on what that number that we set as the goal for consumption, this could be successful, could not be successful, most likely was successful. Here we see kind of spotty burn, um, consumed a lot of those cedars that were cut and dropped. Yeah, um, depending on what numbers we set, that would have been successful. Here we see a little bit better consumption of the cut and drop. So depending on our goal, this probably was a successful burn. The next part of the burn plan is going to be your site description. The biggest thing on this is it cannot be done from an office or looking at a map or out of memory. You actually have to get out in the burn unit, walk the entire burn unit, including the perimeter and through the unit, um, describe the fuel types in it if you're dealing with herbaceous growth like grasses and forbs or timber debris slash you know whatever that fuel is we need to know what the fuel type is and the fuel load so and this doesn't have to be overly detailed light moderate heavy um if you're doing something such as debris buildup in a hardwood stand you might measure you know three four inches of leaf litter measure the vegetation the predominant vegetation to see what you're working with and describe the hazards some of these hazards are going to be obvious such as widow makers or, hang, or hanging dead trees, um, fences, bluffs, uh, rock ledges. Some of them might not be obvious, such as an old mine shaft or an old well. You know, someone walking through a unit could trip in that very easily and get seriously hurt. But these units need to be identified prior to the burn being ignited. And not all burn units are created equal. And what that really means is if you're burning different types of stands, you're going to have different fire behavior and characteristics. Fields usually burn pretty intense, fast flame lengths or hot, large flame lengths, fast burning, short duration. But you tend to have good visibility across the unit and there's very little mop up at the end of the burn. Forested areas tend to be um, have a higher risk for scorching. There tend to be snags in the unit, falling trees or branches. You end up with a variable in flame length and intensities based on the fuel types and amounts, such as hardwood stands tend to have a lower intensity. But if you have a mixture of pine in there, you see your intensity jump up when you hit those pine needles and flame lengths would do the same. And with forested units, you usually have a lot more mop up and mop up is a must to make sure that those smoldering logs near burn lines are either put out or moved deep enough into, into the unit to where it's not an issue. Next things in your burn plan is going to be your weather prescription. So this is really where you get into what weather conditions you're going to use to achieve your goal and to get the fire to behave the way you want it. You're going to create 
a set of conditions that are going to be safe and accomplish your objectives. And when you do it, when you're setting your weather prescriptions, you want to keep it simple, but keep it specific enough to achieve what you want to achieve. If you make these weather prescriptions so narrow, the odds of you being able to get a burn on the ground are very low. But if they're too broad, you probably won't hit your objective correctly. In every burn plan, you need to identify smoke sensitive areas, rather this be highways, neighborhoods, hospitals, um, certain agriculture type areas such as chicken houses can all be smoke sensitive areas. Um, and just knowing the area around where you're burning helps you identify these. Talking to your neighbors can help you identify potential issues, such as if you have a neighbor with a respiratory issue, um, burning on a day that's not going to smoke them in could be very essential. And that flows directly into your smoke management. The first part of smoke management is identify your smoke sensitive areas. Where can you not put smoke or where do you not want to put smoke? And then you plan for an optimal wind direction and mixing height to achieve your proper man smoke management. So let's do a little example of that. We have a burn unit here in the middle with mile lines going from each direction. And this was done just on Google Maps, free program, very easy to outline, um, you know, your burn unit and kind of plan and map it out. So you look here to the east and north of the unit, you see a highway. So that's one potential smoke management area that you'd have to plan for. You also see a bunch of chicken houses to the north and the east of the unit. And one thing you don't know on the see from the map, but from talking to your neighbors, you have an asthma patient to the north. So what kind of wind directions are going to be acceptable for this? You'd really be looking for any kind of northern and northeastern wind directions to put smoke in a appropriate safe location. The next part is going to be your ignition plan. This is going to be covered in a lot more detail in another section. So we're just going to be very brief about this. But this is where you're going to start your fire, the way you're going to ignite your fire to achieve your objectives. Um, this needs to stay flexible because when you, you actually have fire on the ground, you see how the fire is behaving and you need to be able to adjust to the fire behavior. And you always start with a test fire, <clears throat> which is your last chance to put the fire out and call it off if the weather's not behaving. If you light your test fire and you start getting erratic, unplanned behavior, it's better to call it off and come back on a different day. After you have your ignition, you, your ignition plan, you start developing what you're going to have for fire breaks. Your burn unit comes first and then you decide on your brakes, where to install them and what you're gonna use as brakes. In your burn plan, you should describe the location and the type, whether it be a dozer line, a disc line, a leaf blowing line through the woods, a creek, a road, just some general description of the burn line and the rough width of the burn line or fire break that you're trying to use. The fire break should be mapped out so everyone knows where they're at and have a copy of it for the burn. You can use a free service like Google Earth, or you can ask a biologist to help, and all the game and fish private lands biologists are here to help with it and will do it for you and work with you on it. Um, it really helps to label points along the burn lines so people have a reference location when they're looking at them as well. One question that always comes up with breaks is how big do I need to make them and what do I need to put them? There are many options and there's not a good finalized answer, but some general rule of thumb that we go by on every burn, our fire breaks must be down to bare mineral soil or rock or cleaned of burnable material. Uh, we use natural man-made barriers such as creeks, bluffs, roads, food plots, um, you, when you're trying to plan where to put it, utilize the side of a unit that's going to have lighter fuels adjacent to it. That way, if you do have a spot over, it's easier to fight it. Um, avoid sharp curves, corners, and dog legs, which are essentially just long areas that are long, linear, and skinny. Uh, those areas tend to have higher risk of spot over, so we tend to avoid them. And 
just as a general rule of thumb, go twice the height of any burnable vegetation. Different programs have different specifications, but just a general rule of thumb, twice the height of burnable vegeta vegetation is a good starting point. So let's go over some examples of good fire breaks and maybe not so good. So here we have a nice doze lying through a forest that stands. This is going to be a good fire break. Here we have a green mode strip through what looks like shrub type vegetation. This is going to be a poor fire break. Fire will creep across that fescue very quickly. Here we have a mowed dead grass strip. This is also a poor fire break. Fire will move across that really quickly. Here's a disc um, seat or disc fire break. This is going to be a very good fire break. Fire will not go across it quickly or easily at all. Here's an example of a fire break where we have a nice dead grass field next to what, what was a planet food plot. This is what we call a good example of a green fire break. Fire is not going to move across that uh, green material. It's unburnable. There's no real thatch developed in it. So that's a good fire break. One last thing that's not really in your burn break, but always, oh. One thing that's not in your burn plan, but needs to be addressed prior to your burn is snags and dead trees. These need to be prepared for beforehand or if you don't prepare for them, you will deal with them during the burn. It's much easier to deal with them before the burn. You can cut them or push them down. Um, usually a rule of thumb is within 50 feet of your fire break. If it's too dangerous to cut it down, rake or blow around it. But these snags and dentries usually have some ecological benefit and make habitat for different insects, uh, can make dentries for different wildlife species. So they may be important for you to maintain on your property. So you may choose to blow a rake around all of them rather than losing some in the fire or cutting them down. You should identify them and note them while you're laying out your control lines. And if you're trying to keep them and you have them standing, you can ignite from them. So the fire is the lowest intensity beside your snag and then increases intensity as it burns out and away from it. So let's get some examples of some snags and what happens. You've got a dead tree there that's clearly dead with rotten spots at the bottom and it catch, they catch fire very easily and then you end up having to fight it. If you would have cut it down or pushed it down, this never would have been an issue, but now you're either having to babysit it or something to make sure that it does not create a spot over it, which could create a wildfire. It's much easier to take the snag and cut down before the unit and get them on the ground before you burn. One thing you see is things like this where it may be a living tree, but it has this rotten spot at the bottom. Those are just as dangerous as fully dead trees because they can catch fire, fall, and create issues. Whenever the snag is such as the one here on, in the photo that has fire all the way up, it has several weak spots and it's too dangerous to mess with, you're just going to have to sit there and watch them or find a way to make an additional fire break out around it um, and give it at least plenty of distance in case when, for when it does come down to be safe. It's much easier to prep for them than it is to deal with them once they catch fire. Other things to consider in your burn unit are power poles. Um, power poles will burn, especially if a lot of heat gets on them. But since they're maintained, usually they're very easy to prep around just by um, mowing or weed eating around them and blowing or raking them out. Wooden fence posts can burn really easy and this makes people unhappy. So same preparation as you do on a, on a uh, power pole. Um, a lot of people forget about deer stands in woods and this isn't just an issue for wooden deer stands catching fire but some of these new fiberglass and plastic deer stands melt very easily in a fire so cleaning out around them before burn is very important and utility boxes these things if you light them on fire you're having a bad day um, 
they're not easy to repair and a little bit of time prepping on the front end can save you a big headache on the back end with them. In your burn plan, you're gonna outline your personnel and equipment needs. And this is gonna be the minimum you need to safely conduct the burn. Uh, we'll outline your crew size and your structure. So having a big crew may be good, but if you don't have the proper personnel in that crew that with the proper knowledge, it may be um, a waste of people because you don't have the proper structure. You outline your crew responsibilities in your burn plan. Everyone needs to know what their responsibility is. And you're gonna outline how much and of what type of equipment you need. A lot of times this can be something simple like ATVs with water tanks, or it can even be all the way up to dozers in case something goes wrong. Um, you need to outline what type of ignition tools you're gonna to need. Usually gonna be drip torches on most burns, um, rakes for firefighting, in case something happens, leaf blower to put in temporary line in case you have a spot over, UTV or ATV with water sources. You know, all the equipment you're gonna to need to conduct that burn safely, you should list it out in there. You also should list out your safety zones, which are usually an unburnable area or an area that has additional fire breaks between the unit and um, where people are stationed up and it's an area that if something goes wrong people can go to that's going to be a safe zone is a good starting point to debrief and brief um, your burn plan should outline your hazardous areas such as if there's a bluff wall running through the unit or an area with a bunch of snags um, and if there's anywhere near the unit that has a water source both drinking and for filling up um, pump tanks so that you can fight any spot over that should be identified if there is any. You also need to include your contingency plan of what could go wrong in your burn plan. Because what could go wrong is everything, but this needs to be you know, realistic, but still pretty thought of. Because spot fires across any line is always gonna be an issue. How are you gonna fight them? What's your plan B if this happens? Unforecastic changes in weather, Weather changes and it can change erratically. Fires can create their own weather. So you have to have a plan in case weather conditions change. It's almost undoubtable equipment breaks. Um, when you're in burns, tires tend to pop a lot easier because that extra heat on that rubber makes it a little softer. So you need to have a plan in case you have issues with equipment breaking or flat tires or whatever it may be. And if smoke hazard happens, such as the smoke's not getting off your fire lines, how are you gonna handle that? Or smoke's not behaving the way that you planned it for it to, you need to have a plan for that. And you also need a plan for total escape. Total escape is rare, but the risk is never zero. So a plan needs to be addressed for it. And when you have many people out there working on lines, having a plan for injuries, um, rather it be something major like a broken bone or minor like small cut, you know, having some kind of plan for if someone gets injured is very important. And this section plans out actions if something happens and hopefully nothing happens, but just having a plan in case is very important. And lastly, when you're burning and planning your burn, plan for proper fire etiquette. This is a tool that agencies and landowners use and it needs to be protected. The most common complaints we hear on prescribed fire is gonna be smoke. Um, escapes are rare, but they are a serious concern. We have very liberal fire laws in this state with few regulation and that can change with one incident. When you're burning, you represent the fire community. Smoke columns don't have labels. They don't know whose burn that is. So making sure you're practicing proper fire etiquette keeps the tool around for everyone to use. And be prepared for concerned neighbors or onlookers to have questions and be prepared to talk to them before the burn. And sometimes they wanna help, sometimes they just wanna know what's going on. And with that, I'm gonna open it up for any questions. Thanks for walking us through that. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of landowners, their maybe their first question would be, 
well, who's writing this burn plan? Is it me writing this burn plan? Or is it like an agency like Arkansas Game of Fish or Quell Forever or et cetera, et cetera, uh, forestry division. And there's a lot of agencies out there. Um, so what kind of what are your thoughts? So a burn plan can be written by a landowner. If you decide to write your own plan, I recommend having it reviewed by a professional. Um, Arkansas Game of Fish private lands biologists will review them. Oh, they're also writing for you. Quell Forever biologists, Arkansas Forestry Division, county foresters will all write burn plans for landowners. Um, it's part of our job responsibilities. And if you want to write your own, we'll gladly review it for you. So that just comes down to what, which way of individual landowner wants to go with it. But there's numerous options for them. Okay. They just got to pick which one they want to go with. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm sure a lot of landowners are interested in possibly learning how to write their own burn plans so they can have their, you know, kind of be independent from an agency, but it's always nice that, you know, if they have any questions that they can lean on an well, agency. Let me just do a little shameless plug for the Learn to Burn 2 <laughs> class the in-person. You get a lot more detail on how to write your own burn plans. Yeah, which is great. And that'll be good because this is just kind of a, a brief introduction to the whole world of prescribed fire. And those Learn to Burn, cla Learn to Burn 2 classes rather will get more in depth in things, which is great. Um, my other question is, you were talking about trying to determine the objective of the property, like your resource objective, what you were trying to tackle in terms of um, with prescribed fire. Um, does a landowner have to decide that or can they get a biologist to come out and look to help them out? So ultimately, it's going to be the landowner's decision. Mm -hmm. um, they're the one that wants to burn. They're the one that needs to make a decision mm -hmm. on what the objective is. But getting a biologist mm -hmm. out there, we can kind of help work you help you work your way through it to determine the appropriate objective. So if you're kind of wanting to improve wildlife habitat, but say for Bob White quail, but you're not exactly sure how to tackle that. Mm -hmm. We can go out there and help walk you through where well, you're going to need to burn at these times and these ways. So our objective is going to be this to, you know, probably mm -hmm. going to be decrease woody vegetation and open areas, stimulate native herbaceous growth. So we can address those issues with you to try to help meet your objective. Gotcha. And kind of help outline what that objective is based on your overall goal for your property. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, so that's all the questions that I have at this moment, unless you want to add anything else, Calvin. Um, um, that's if you're all good, I have. Okay, if you're good, then I'll kind of end it here with, um, just as a reminder, all these online Learn to Burn One courses will be available either on the Quell Forever in Arkansas Facebook or YouTube page. And they should also be available on the Arkansas um, Game and Fish Commission's social media platforms as well. And so with that, thanks again, Calvin. If you have any other questions, be sure to reach out to your local private lands biologist with Game and Fish, um, or you can reach out to your local Well Forever Farm Bill biologist. We're always happy to help. And with that, I'll say goodbye and see you in the next video. Yeah, have a good one. Thank you.